Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Ask Mike. There's a lot to talk about between football and basketball. I feel refreshed because I just came back from a week vacation, so I'm ready to go. But it seems like one of these teams, when I was <laughs> flying back home, wasn't so ready to go. And there are a lot of questions about the Arkansas basketball team, Mike. And the first one comes from the shocking loss to Hofstra happened in North Little Rock. And that's when Tucker says, uh, we need to start playing zone defense and or stop switching on the pick and rolls or stop overplaying the pick. Do you agree with what he's saying on Twitter? Oh, well, that's a good point. I'm not a coach and I'm sure <laughs> he's not either. But it's in response to the fact that they did have a lot of problems on defense. And there's been all this focus on the fact that these guys can't seem to shoot very well but to me their defense in the last two games Oklahoma and Hofstra has been as big a problem as lack of shooting and what we've seen is all these backdoor cuts and as he pointed out they don't seem to be fighting through these these uh, you know these picks so you know you can talk about why it's happening but a lot of coaches stick with a man defense no matter what but they generally play man better than this mm -hmm. so what's Musselman going to do I don't know I don't know if he would consider going more with a zone or not the the problem with that is if you go to a, if you zone instead of man then and you're playing a team that shoots a, from behind the arc really well then you know, you're not covering those guys up very well up front. It's harder out of the zone. I'm not saying you can't do it. But the problem is their three-point defense out of a man has not been very good either. So I don't know that it would hurt, and it would certainly appear to help inside. But there are a lot of people that I've talked to that just feel like these guys are not energetic enough. They're not aggressive, and that's why they're not doing it. It's not that they can't. For whatever reason, they're not doing it so you know, there's a, there, there are complaints that these guys are soft. When you look at some of the guys last year that they had on this team, they just compare the, these guys to those guys mm -hmm. and say, man, there's some softness going on right. here. Right, and I will so answer that. So we'll see if he makes any changes like that. Uh, the point is well taken. He said in his Monday press conference, Eric Musselman, that they switched defenses like three times. They went from their zone and went to off-pick defense. Then they switched uh, coverages. Just didn't seem to work, he said, and he was very surprised. Well, and again, to Hoster my played. point, I don't know that it's the scheme. The people I've talked to said they're just not performing. And so, uh, but again, his point, is, it may be as well taken, but apparently that's not the only issue is that what they're what they're doing with that man and Jay Brooks brings up a really good point that has been echoed throughout the season which is on this basketball team little to no chemistry definite signs of smoke behind the scenes I know that there's some chemistry issues when yeah. you bring in a bunch of transfers but the smoke well, behind that, the scene what do you think that means that's that's just what <laughs> fans do when when a team you got this many newcomers on a team and that team is struggling, you're going to have fans speculating there's some kind of disagreement going on. Or It would be very easy to assume that each one of these, these new grad transfers, each one of them had been kind of the star, or the big scorer on their previous team. Mm -hmm. So you bring them in here and you're not getting the playing time you did before and you don't have that star status anymore. And so maybe you're upset about that. Or maybe uh, you come in here in Musselman. I mean, he's very hard on these players. Everybody knows that. I mean, he's yelling and screaming at these guys a lot. So maybe they came in, they're shocked by that, and they don't like that. I mean, there's all kinds of speculation about that. I haven't been told by anybody I'm talked to, that I've talked to, that that's what's really going on here. So the smoke behind the scenes is kind of a that's Fizzle. just a, that's just kind <laughs> of a theory. It's there's no hard evidence of, of this that I've seen. And it'll only get better with time, as they always say, as the season goes on. Now, we have kind of a two-parter, two people asking quite the same question. Hog Girl says, uh, Williams, Jalen Williams, definitely didn't look like himself. Several of them almost seemed almost lethargic, and Dina H. Adams adds, uh, Williams was tired. She was in the front row watching. He seemed very tired. Now, could you see that from the television broadcast as well? No, there was no TV broadcast. <laughs> oh, there was the, the Hofstra so game? I, I definitely couldn't pick up. But <laughs> oddly enough, on the radio, Chuck Barrett, who was doing the radio commentary, did say Jalen Williams looked tired. Now, this prompted 
A lot of speculation on the internet that night, that would be Saturday night, the night that the game was played, that there was a flu thing going around and that Jalen had the flu, that Connor Vanover, who never got up off the bench, never played at all, that, oh, it was because he had the flu, some other guys had the flu. I've checked as nearly as I can check on that, and that I'm told that's nonsense. Nobody mm -hmm. had the flu. That's not what was going on there. So whatever was going on, if I'm going to speculate, because you can speculate, I guess, <laughs> remember how Eric Musselman talked about, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if you were back when he had that th uh, Thursday press conference, but he said he'd worked them hard on Monday, he'd worked them hard on Tuesday and on Wednesday, and they looked really good, and he was happy. And then mm -hmm. <laughs> Thursday, it was terrible. Well, I'm going to speculate that he wore them out. I mean, you, you, this time of year when you've been working and practicing as long as they have and played games, you send them through three hard practices, you might wear them out for the right. game. So that fatigue might have had something to do with the fact that they worked out too hard trying to correct some of these problems and, and just ended. And that may be why they were so lethargic on defense. Yeah, and Jalen Williams has dealt with a back injury, a nagging back injury. It seems like he's at 100%, but you never know if that could factor in. Uh, and it's he funny. He definitely got dominated because the former Razorback, Bay Bay, uh, whatever the last name, I'm having a hard <laughs> yeah, time. I always had a hard time pronouncing try. that name. E -E 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 Eola, I think yeah. is what it is. You know, this is a guy that played for about two minutes when he was at Arkansas and got into about two minutes of a game. Now he was hurt here. I think he had an ACL. But he just killed Arkansas in the paint. I mean, the Hofstra had like 20, Arkansas had like 26 points in the paint. Hofstra had 44. He was blocking shots. He was rebounding. He pretty much dominated Jalen Williams in that, that, again, there was speculation. Why is Connor Vano not in the mm -hmm. game? You got a seven foot four, five, six guy out there. You need help. You, you've got these six, six forward slash small, or guard slash small, small forwards trying to deal with that. And you have this big guy out there, and you, you, a lot of people figure, well, I mean, Connor Vanover can rebound at seven foot right. five yeah, or four or whatever. The rim by just reaching up. So there was a lot of speculation on why that happened too, and there's not been an explanation for that. So you brought up something that Jimmy Kersey is suggesting, and he suggested sarcastically, maybe they had the river market flu. You say that's not the case, yeah. but. <laughs> They turn around and play two games really quick. You play Hofstra on Saturday, now you're playing Elon on Tuesday. So maybe that fatigue rolls over? Yeah, not the flu, but it could be fatigue. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if they look more energetic. Maybe he didn't work them out as hard. I don't, you can't really practice hard when, between, right. when you've just got a short period of time between games. Yeah, Monday they practice so. an hour and a half, which yeah. we are taping this on a Monday. They practice an hour and a half yeah. um, before that game. Blood Red Hog, a name we're always familiar seeing on here, says, do, Mike, do you feel the main issue with the Hog basketball team is a lack of leadership? There is no Justin Smith or Moses Moody on this team. And you mentioned that comparison. They're always going to be brought back to last year's team. Do you feel that leadership? That's a good question. Well, is a fact. And I would throw Jalen Tate into that mix. He mentioned two. There's three of them. And I, I haven't seen a, a kind of a replacement for any of those three guys. So basically what you're talking about is you had a power forward last year who could score and who could rebound. They haven't had anybody who's been dominant in that way. They had a point guard. They could not only score, but he was tall and he could, he got a lot of assists. They don't have that so far. And then in Moses Moody, you had a an off guard, back. a shooting <laughs> guard who was 6'6 and who could go inside and create a short range jumper, could go in and even score, but could also create his own outside shots, didn't have to have a lot in the way of assists and could hit those shots. And they don't have any of those three guys that mm -hmm. as of now, nobody stepped up to replace those three guys, at least in terms of the effectiveness, effectiveness that those three guys had. So it makes a big difference when you, I mean, there was a, when Musselman brought in all these grad transfers, there was a feeling, okay, you know, we got guys coming in that can do this. And so far they haven't. Here's another big question. All good questions so far. These are what have been the big topics of discussion. Final question for basketball is coming from T.L. Slayton about the fact that this team has not developed a point guard uh, through 11 games this season, he says K.K. Robinson played four minutes, has had four assists in that in that game against Hofstra. The other three point guards played a combined 87 minutes 
and had six. So what is up with that? Well, that, that's another one of those mysteries like Connor Vanover not playing. Now, you started KK. He goes out, and in the first four minutes of the game, he sets up four other guys with, with made baskets. So that's what you need to do, right? And they were down by two when he left. Now, he left the game because he got two quick fouls in four minutes. That, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. What's not, at least has not been explained, is why he never Put came back. back. In. Because, you know, if you can get four assists in four minutes, I think that beats six assists from combined three other guys and at, were on the floor for a combined 87 minutes or whatever. So that a lot of people don't understand why KK didn't get back in the game because he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was right. running the point and setting up other guys with shots, and they made those shots, and it was a close game at that point. They weren't down by 10 or 14 or whatever like they were later on. That's an issue that they're going to keep addressing, and that goes with Connor Vanover, too. Why isn't he on the bench? It seems like there's a lot of minutes that need to be spread around. Exactly. Maybe they haven't yet. I know. Our... And, and maybe we'll get some answers in, in the game coming up with Elon. Elon, <laughs> three and nine, but they've played some amazing teams this season. I think Arkansas is like their second or third SEC competition of the yeah. year. All right, let's go now to football. Obviously, we got an Outback Bowl on January 1st. We have a lot of questions coming for those hogs. And Hog Minus uh, wants to know, Hog Minus Nut wants to know, will Trey Williams' DWI affect his playing time in the bowl game? He got that on Sunday would, night at 1 a.m. I would say yes, because yesterday he announced he's not playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, the, the speculation on that is, okay, who made that decision? Did Sam Pittman say, okay, okay, you got this, I want you out of here. Or, did, or did, did he decide on his own, I'm gone? Well, you said speculation is what you can do. Well, I have, the word I'm getting is that, no, Sam Pittman didn't say automatically you're out of here, that, and that they might, might have indeed played him in the second half after a first half suspension or something. But now I want to say that he did get some support on social media because I read some of it. You know, everybody can make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's go back and talk about what happened. And this is weird because he now becomes the third Razorback or ex-Razorback to get a DUI while they were apparently either asleep or passed out in the drive-through <laughs> lane of a fast food restaurant. Yep. There was a guy named <laughs> Butu, a nickname Butu, years ago that fell asleep in a McDonald's. I think it was the same one. The one on Martin Luther King? It was the one on MLK. <laughs> he, he was just, and you can, I don't know, he tested uh, over the limit, I guess. So anyway, he, he got one. Then Darren McFadden either fell asleep or was, that happened to him. And, and this was after his football career was over. And now we have another one. So I'm not sure what's going on in these drive through lanes. It's always really late at night. Now, it's interesting that he tested .09. .09. .09, yep. For old guys like me, when I was in college, it was .10. So if I had been in that lane back in my day, they'd have just said, hey, wake Here's up, Here's your bud. food. Here's your food. <laughs> Get out of here. They wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten a DUI because I'd have been under the limit. But it's, it's .08 now. So he's over the limit, and they're getting more and more stringent on that. One of these days, if you have, if you like sniffed of alcohol, you're just in trouble. So uh, I don't know. But anyway, he, he, he tested above the limit when they tested him. Mm -hmm. So supposedly he was just, yeah, he had some support, but there were a lot of other people that just ripped him. And what I heard was he was just very embarrassed by the whole thing and said, man, I've screwed up. I'm embarrassed my team. I'm, I'm just going to go yeah. and concentrate on where I go next, which is he's going to try to make it in the draft. When you get do something like that, it makes it harder. These NFL people look at this stuff, especially if you're borderline. You know, if they're trying to decide where they're going to take you, you know, you're not a first, second, third round or whatever, that could affect you. Right. So it's we'll just see. like any other employer you could mm -hmm. apply for. They'll look at that stuff for sure. So uh, let's see if this affects him. But uh, for all accounts, he's a nice guy, and he apologized for it, said he was embarrassed, mm -hmm. wish he could do it over again, but he can't. Right. He, uh, the DWI came out at 1, 11 a.m. on Sunday, that same day before 5 p.m., uh, Trey Williams declaring for the NFL draft. Uh, all right, moving on. Hawk Hawkins says, 
I see where Bumper Pool has been invited to play in one of those post bowl all star games. I think it's like the collegiate bowl he's going to. Does that mean he's not going to come back? Also, what about Ridgeway? I know that Coach Pittman said he's trying to convince both of them to come back this next season. Ridgeway going to the Reese's Senior Bowl. Okay. As far as I know, they haven't accepted yet. And as long as you don't go there, work out, and play in it, you can come back. And so you get invited. You don't necessarily have to immediately accept it. What's, both of those guys were working out on Monday. So they're clearly both just planning to play in the bowl game. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would you be out there working out? I wouldn't be. So I'm assuming that both are going to play in the Outback Bowl. And as long as, again, now, now Sam Pittman, and you saw this, he was talking a little bit about how this works. And he said, I've had guys come in, a lot of these guys come in and ask me, what is my latest, the latest on me from the NFL draft people? And, and they show them where they think they are. But he said, unless somebody specifically comes in and tells me I'm coming back, I'm leaving, he said, I don't ask. He said, that my job is to get us ready for the bowl game. The, all, most of this stuff, like with Poole and Ridgeway and all that, that's going to come after the bowl game. Right. If they, haven't, if, if they have not accepted the invite and have not, I don't know what, what technically, if you accepted it and then didn't show up, I still think you're all right. But apparently th those two guys and some others are going to wait till after the bowl game to decide what they're going to do. But Pittman definitely wants those two back. Yeah, Monteric Brown, Pittman said in his press conference on Monday, he was asked, will he come back? He obviously has an invite to the East-West Shrine game, and Pittman said, I haven't really talked to him yet, but leaning towards Monteric Brown yeah, not Yeah, he, he did not back. think he would come back. So that's one to keep an eye on as well. Jordan Silver invited to the Reese's Senior Bowl. So a few Razorbacks have a decision on if they play another bowl game after the Outback Bowl game. All right, here's a familiar name we always see. It's Pork Soda. He wants to know what that early, with the early signing period now over, what can we expect in recruiting between now in the February signing period. Yeah, I talked to Otis Kirk. He's our recruiting guru. And uh, there's, there's a guy, and I don't have a name here. I'm looking around for it because <laughs> I don't do recruiting. I'm, I see a cornerback out of Tulsa. Is that yeah, what we're talking yeah, where's about? The, where's that name? Gentry Williams. Yeah, Gentry Williams. Is that Williams, we're seeing a four-star? Yeah. He's um, a four-star, and I think he's committed to Oklahoma but didn't sign with them. So they're still trying to recruit him. Um, Otis didn't seem real optimistic that that would work, but he's one guy that they're still out there trying to bring in. Mostly what you're going to see, according to Otis, between now and signing day, if we get more players in, you're going to see this guy transfers out, this guy hits the portal, whatever he is, defensive mm -hmm. tackle or whatever, then you will see them go after somebody similar to that to bring in to replace that guy. And I think in some cases – they have their eye on who they want to bring in, but somebody's got to leave first. And then if they do, then you, you, you bring this other person in. But I don't think you're going to see, according to Otis, I don't think you're going to see a lot of, of high school guys added. Might be one or two, maybe, maybe. But probably what gets added between now and national, the late signing day, national signing day, would be uh, portal people. Portal people. Portal people. We'll see. I know that's... It comes at a cost. Someone's got to leave for someone to come in. You only get, what, 85 full scholarships, yeah, I think key, it is. And he had said earlier in the week, because there was some speculation that they'd, on signing day, that they'd gone, early signing day, they'd gone over. And what do you do, blah, 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 if you're over? Mm -hmm. He said, if anything, we're going to be under, because they, they've had a large number of people that have left in the last right. few days. He said, if anything, we're going to be under, not over the 85 limit. Here's, um, we were speaking about will people go professional. We'll turn our attention to a pro. Pat Boat on Hogville says, with Jerry Jacobs starting in the NFL for the Detroit Lions, makes me wonder, is there a backstory on how he wasn't a starter over Hudson Clark? Was it the three interceptions Clark had against Ole Miss uh, or something else? Well, that, apparently that was it. You know, uh, Hudson Clark had that great game against Ole Miss. Yeah, 2020 and, that was, yeah. Yeah. What did it say? I think it's a 2000 yeah, on the graphic. 2020. <laughs> and uh, he had that great game, so he then became the starter. And at that point, I guess Jacobs quit. 
right? That's what I remember. He was just gone. And he apparently said after at the combine later that next year, he said at the combine, I probably shouldn't have done that. I probably should have stuck it out mm -hmm. and just competed for that job. And I think he would have had a chance to play quite a bit. I don't know if he'd ever been the starter again, but Clark had problems after that from time to time. He had that great game and got a lot of attention, but then it, he didn't always follow it up. So I think he probably could have played a lot. Mike, Mike could have won his job back. He seemed to be suggesting that when he made that statement. But how many of us have, and you don't have to be a football player to do this, how many times have you overreacted to a situation in your life? Oh, well, I'm mad about that. I'm going to do this. And then you look back about six months later or a year and go, oh, what was oh, I thinking? What was I doing there? I shouldn't have done that. And I think he would have had a chance to get his job back. He's clearly a very talented player. Yeah, well, it's not often you hear a backup from college become a starter in the NFL. It doesn't happen all that often. Right. So it says a lot about his work ethic. All right, Pig's Feet says on Hogville, Arkansas fans see their players through hog-colored glasses, but it seems improbable that Burks is left off of the AP All-American team while Ohio State has three wide receivers on it. Do you believe the OSU players are all better than Burks? Also, do you think Burks is a first-round draft pick in the NFL this year? I think both of those questions might be pretty easy. Well, here's the, here's the problem with AP. You're talking about sports writers. Now, there are a few guys out there that are sports writers that I think know what's going on. But here's my problem with a lot of sports writers. They're too regional in their thinking. You know, I'm in this area. I cover these guys. So I'm just going to and, and, mm -hmm. and let's face it. If you went around the country and looked where these AP guys are that vote, they're not around here. Not a lot of them. And for whatever reason, a, a lot of them are concentrated in that Big Ten area. So I think this is how stuff like this happens. You don't have balanced voting anyway. And then those guys, sports writers, tend to look at certain power schools. You know, I don't just mean power five schools. I'm saying schools that like Ohio State that are effective every year and have, are in, getting a lot of publicity. And then a school like Arkansas gets overlooked. So a guy like Traylon Burks doesn't get voted the way he should. I've always said... You should be able to look at the coaches' poll and get a better look because I trust coaches more than sports writers any day, any of, the week. day of the week. Problem is, the coaches don't always vote. A lot of them are busy and they let their sports information directors <laughs> vote. So I'm not sure you come out any better <laughs> off. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about what the AP does because those guys are by and large yo yo's. I, I, I would never go, oh, I didn't get picked by AP for this. I got tech with AP, bunch of sports writers. But I trust NFL scouts. That's right. Yeah. And here's the, here's the difference in those two situations. Yes, he'll be a first rounder. And the NFL scouts don't care where you're from. They don't care who you played for. We see that over and over again. We see small mid-majors. Guys from small mid-majors. Yeah. Yeah, even, yeah, FCS schools. Uh, we see those guys in the NFL and playing very well because all those NFL scouts are doing is looking at, oh, can this guy help come in and help us win? So he's not going to have the problem with the sports writers that he has with the, the I mean, the agents know. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's another reason not to worry about what these, whether or not he was picked AP first. And team. there throughout the season, there was NFL scouts a lot during yeah, those practices exactly. that we were filming. So I, I know that they have. He'll the get his revenge when he's playing in the <laughs> NFL. Uh, I think so too. First rounder, I bet. I bet. All right. Hatman Hog asks Is it remotely possible that Coach Sam Pittman can be renegotiating his contract in order to take care of his assistant coaches? He gives them credit for virtually every positive thing that happens with the Hogs. Doesn't it make sense that he'd want them taken care of so they'll stick around? That's a pretty good leadership uh, question as well. Well, it, it, it's, it's a possible answer for this whole Sexton thing because the, the, sec, the hiring of Jimmy Sexton just shocked a lot of Hog fans because they couldn't see why a guy, Sam Pittman, who sat around for two years and talked about he didn't even hardly know what his contract was and he was at Arkansas for life and... All of a sudden, you got this high-powered agent that has a history of 
getting wads of money out for his clients, and then if the clients fail, so what? They got they a, have the money. They got a He's huge got buyout, and they just take off. I mean, Gus Malzahn. I mean, Sexton used Arkansas to get Malzahn that huge contract with a monster buyout, and then he, they fire him, and he goes off to Orlando with a boatload of money. So Hog fans were upset about that. Well, when Sam Pittman was asked about it, his first press conference after that was announced, he said that it wasn't just about the money for him, it was about contracts for his assistant coaches. I think he talked to the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. We may have a graph on what he said, uh, if you can pop that up. Uh, well, I, don't, I guess they don't have it. <laughs> there it is. This is from Hunter Juracek to the Arkansas Democrat Gazette last week, and he said, one of the things I want to do is reward our assistant coaches for having a great year. I don't want to reward them for looking at other jobs. I want to reward them for having a great year here at the University of Arkansas. What he's saying in effect, and, that, and then the last part of that, if you look at programs across the country that have some really solid continuity within their coaching staffs, it helps you from a recruiting standpoint. It helps you in the develop of young men, development of young men. It's important that we retain as many, if not all, of our assistant coaches moving forward. Mm. So this is his response to the fact that he's going to be negotiating with a lot more people. <laughs> Jim, well, but Sexton in particular with regard to Pittman. What that seems to suggest is that part of what's going on with Pittman's new contract is better stuff for his assistant coaches. Now, some of those assistants, the, no, the coordinators in particular, have agents. They may all have agents. I don't know. But uh, that's a possible explanation. But, but the fact of the matter is the word is already out there, and I, I think it's accurate that Sexton is asking for a $7 million salary, annual salary, for Sam Pittman. Mm -hmm. That would more than double his current salary. Now, some people have said, well, wait a minute. Uh, Lane Kiffin got $7 million. Uh, Jimbo Fisher's getting nine. Brian Kelly's coming down from Notre Dame at LSU to get nine. So that's not that much money. Uh, other people have said, wait a minute. Pittman's, this is his second year as a head coach. He hasn't been coaching as long as those other guys have been. And they're not doubling their salary in most cases. He would be doubling his salary. So they think, well, that's a little too much. And that's not in line with what he was saying earlier about it's not about the, when he said it's not about the money here. But I talked about this last week. If, you, if, if Jimmy Sexton is your agent, but you make a public statement after you hire him and saying, I'm not going anywhere, this doesn't mean I'm going to take another job, then you've effectively kind of limited what, you know, Jimmy Sexton can like, do. Yeah, because showing your hand a little bit. If he goes into negotiations with Hunter Juracek and he says, hey, I'd like $7 million for my client, look around at what the other SEC West coaches are making, this is only fair. And your check says, yeah, but that's not what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you, uh, I'll go four. Well, no, how about 4.5? Well, I'm out, how about 4.2? And then what I expect your check to do is what he's already done, which is load that contract up, if it's a new contract, with performance incentives. Same Be as this year. This year, yeah. because his actual salary, he got. What, how much was it, like $750,000 in performance? Yes, because he got one for the six wins, yeah. seven, eight, and a bowl. I do believe it added up to some, some, $750,000. $750, and this is what he said when he was hired. I'm talking about Hunter Juracek. He's against these mega bucks coaching salaries and the monster buyouts. What he favors, and I think most fans, now some fans don't care. It's not their money. Hey, throw a wads of money at this coach. I don't care. But then they're the ones that want the guy fired as soon as yeah, exactly. they didn't do what they want. And then, then they're not the ones that have to pay that mega buyout. But I think most fans that I read on social media favor this incentive-based contracts, And it only makes sense. If you believe in yourself as a head coach when you take a job, I believe I'm a good coach. I believe I can get this job, this program going. I can turn this around. Then you would accept a contract that said, okay, well, we're starting you down here. A little low, but if you achieve all this stuff, you can make a lot of money. 
And uh, so that's kind of a, that's where your check is coming from. And I personally like it. And I think a yeah. lot of fans I've talked to like that approach. Yeah, prove it or lose it. And I know and after their sixth win of the season, when he got that first initial bowl bonus, Pittman said in the press conference, his assistant coaches also got bowl bonuses. So maybe they're on an incentive program as well. All right, Alex for Hogs 88 on Hogville asks, if you were to throw a Christmas party and could invite the SEC football coaches to come, which ones would you invite? Of course, you got to invite the pit boss. And which ones would you uh, would lose that invitation? How many invites are you going to give out? What do you got? Three, four? Okay. First <laughs> of all, it would never be an invitation to a birthday party because I don't Christmas party. I don't like. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't like a birthday, birthday parties. That's <laughs> all nonsense. What it would be is it would be a golf outing. Okay. And it would have to be a good one. It would be like somebody's funding this, so we're all going to go to St. Andrews in, in, in Scotland and play the <laughs> old course, which I've always wanted to do. So we'll go over there, and who am I taking with me? Because I'm not paying for well, this Well, I know anyway. who you're not, but yeah, go ahead. I'm not paying for this, so <laughs> I'm just going to take who I want. I would take Pittman, absolutely. I would take Mike Leach. He'd be hilarious on the trip <laughs> over there. He'd say all this stuff. He'd be talking about Geronimo and... I could be talking about the Alamo, and we could talk about all this history and the Wild West and all this stuff. That'd be fun. Uh, I would take Nick Saban because I think oh. Nick Saban away from football would be an interesting guy. He's the best coach ever in college football, better than Newt Rockney if you go back a million years, better than him, better than the Bear. His record speaks for itself. He's the best of all time. So, yeah, I'd want him there just to talk to him about why do you think you succeed mm -hmm. uh, way beyond what others do. So I'd have Saban there. And um, I think I'd have Kirby Smart, you know. I think I'd even have, keel kind of guy, well, round I, out the I group. Just, I just like him. I like his approach. You know, he's getting ripped a little bit because of what happened in the you know, SEC championship game. But I, I, I'd take him. Now, who would Who not? would you not invite? Yeah, this not? is more fun. Okay. Absolutely, right <laughs> off the bat, no Eli Drinkwitz. <laughs> yeah, I figured that was one. A uh, twerp. I don't want to spend my golf outing with a twerp. So, no <laughs> Eli Drinkwitz. Hey, Sorry, he's, Alma. He's not coming. Uh, poof. Even though I have no nothing personal against Jimbo Fisher, nobody from A&M would ever go. No Aggie yeah, would ever go like, on yeah. my golf <laughs> outing. So, he can't go. No way. And then the only other one would definitely be out would be Widow Wayne Kiffin. <laughs> he can't go. Don't want him there. Don't care about him. <laughs> go away. And then the, all the others, it's not that I have anything against you. It's just I, I would take a fivesome. You know, you can't have 12 guys on a golf course. So it would be four guys and me, a fivesome, which is about as many as you want to play, when you're pl play with when you're playing golf, and it would be the five guys I already mentioned. I'd probably take Coach O. If I'm allowed to take one right now, yeah. Coach O, he would play 16 holes, and then he'd be absent for the last two. I, I was around Coach O when he's a grad <laughs> assistant here. The guy's wacky. I wouldn't. I just feel like he could hit a driver so far. Yeah, no Coach O. No Coach O. Lane Kiffin would give you free golf balls. They toss them at him everywhere he goes. <laughs> also, I want to correct one thing before we leave. About I said last week, we were asked a question about whether or not these early, these early signees, because it was after signing day, and they have all these early signees, like 18 of them or whatever, if any of those guys could come in and participate in the bowl workouts and could they play in the bowl game? And I said, no, they had to be enrolled before they could do that. That's wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. They actually had, Sam Pittman today talked about there were two local guys that are early signees that actually went over today and participated in the bowl workout. It was an indoor workout. He said they were lost, didn't know <laughs> yeah, what they were doing. Makes sense. And he stuck them both on the scout team. If you've ever been on a scout team, you know what that means. You're just kind of standing over there going, okay, don't run over me. I'm, <laughs> I'm the scout team. But they were out there. Now, the other part of that question was, could they play? And <laughs> no. I mean, you're not going to come in and become a, a part of a team's offense in two weeks that they've spent the whole going all the way back to the yeah, previous spring and the all season working on. So they're not, you're not going to see any of these guys play in a game, but they can apparently work out, and I was wrong about that. Yeah, it's a new rule that we all kind of learned today. I was shocked about the same thing. I didn't know that. Well, running with chickens like their heads cut off at practice. Let's they try and find were, a few of them next lost. time we go. That'll do it for Ask Mike, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Much more next Monday.